Hello YouTube, uh, my name is Jimmy T. I guess you could call me Jimmy as my username currently states. And I'm in grade nine in an enhanced program. Maybe going into the IB program when I'm older. So I guess I'm in enhanced for every subject except math and science, which I'm doing grade 10 this semester. And with everything, it can get a bit confusing. So I felt the need to kind of just say everything out loud. Um, tell you guys my notes. Hopefully I didn't get anything wrong in here, but if you do, just tell me in the comments and I'll make sure to get that fixed. I'm having my test tomorrow, so I guess I'll start off. Today I'm going to be working with geography. So I'm going to turn off my night light here. So stuff like, um, clouds and climate and weather and stuff like that right now for this unit so to start this off we'll go with like uh what's weather so weather is kind of like the state of the atmosphere at any particular place or time so walking down the road it's snowing again fun but the next day it's raining. You know, you don't know what's going to really happen because it's just a particular place or time. It's not averaged over everything. Then there's climate. Climate is the weather in some location averaged over a period of time. It actually makes sense that day after day it keeps flipping snowing. People who study these things uh, weather or uh, they are meteorologists and climate people are climatologists. Um, the major factors that affect climate are, well, the abbreviation is LOAM, or I think it's acronym, uh, latitude, ocean currents, winds and air masses, elevation, relief, and near water. Um, so next thing up is what is a continent, continental climate? A continental climate is a climate with a very high temperature range and very little precipitation. Um, this is because like, near, there are a lot of near bodies of water often to moderate the climate, but there can also be none. You know, it just depends on the other low end factors. So I guess an example of this might be Edmonton, you know, uh, sometimes it can be really cold in the winters and it can be really hot in the summers, but it's not really moderated heavily. Uh, so that's yeah, kind of what causes it. Um, and very little precipitation as well, I guess. <laughs> um, for maritime climate, they have a very low temperature range. So, you know, it doesn't change too much in the winter and the summer. It isn't as drastic, and they have a lot, a lot more precipitation. I find that something like this is that, um, uh, what was the thing? Where I live, it snows a lot, but it doesn't get as cold as other places, like more north. I don't want to tell you my exact location, but uh, down in, I think it might have been Sudbury, a bit farther down. Uh, it can get a lot colder, but it doesn't snow as much. Um, so another cool fact is the growing season. This starts at about five degrees Celsius, uh, maybe 5.5 in between there. My teacher can't seem to find the exact thing, but you know. Um, next up, prevailing winds. The prevailing winds in Canada are the westerlies. So they blow from west to east. Ooh, this one's kind of cool, actually. So air masses are volumes of air that have horizontally uniform properties of regarding temperature to a lesser extent, humidity. In English, this means that air masses are just kind of like big bubbles of air. Well, not like, you get what I mean. They're kind of like air pockets that are like, um, 
they have a certain temperature around there. So like deserts, like hot deserts, you know, they're usually covered by an air mass, I find. And they can also control stuff like humidity, which is the amount of water vapor in air. Which is next thing, actually. Uh, so you notice how sometimes when it gets really hot outside, you get that icky, wet feeling. That's because humidity, again, is the amount of water vapor now. So clouds. Ooh, and then we get to show, then I get to tell you about different types of precipitation and how clouds form. Um, so clouds are masses of condensed water vapor and ice crystals. And they're classified according to the altitude and shape. So, as it, they, like, clouds will go up farther, and they'll get cooler, and they'll condense into, like, ice crystals and water vapor. I find that really cool. Like, when I was younger, I dream about being, like, controlling water, or, like, ice or something. Controlling clouds, though, and being able to form that, them, that'd be way cooler, because then you kind of control both. Um... Humidity. Precipitation! It, oh, yep. Precipitation is any moisture falling from the sky. Some examples of this are rain, snow, and hail. And then here's how clouds form. So, uh, the first type is frontal lifting or, or graphic precipitation. Or, oh, sorry, no. Cyclonic precipitation. Frontal lifting or cyclonic precipitation. Uh, this type of precipitation occurs when a cold and warm front collide, forcing it rise cold events. So, kind of like imagine this. Two opposing forces, one staying still, refusing to move for fear of their lives, the other, they're ready to fight. They're going at them and... Whoop. So, when this happens, the air will kind of go up, it'll cool, condense, and... Precipitate. Um, the second type, this is my favorite because I love pictures of this. I actually know how to explain this, so I'm going to look up a picture. So, orographic precipitation or relief precipitation is kind of when, um, I know a topographic barrier. Uh, it's when moist air is lifted over a topographic barrier such as a uh, mountain range. So what kind of happens is this is your mountain and this is the moist air. So it's kind of going up and up. It's cooling as it gets farther, farther up. It's condensing. Can't go up any farther. Rains. So one side of the mountain will be just covered in lush grass and it'll be gorgeous. And the other side is just completely desert because it's called a dry shadow. So it's like a shadow of just desert. Um, real life photos. I can't find anything real at the moment. I'm just gonna pause this. So I couldn't really find any real, really good pictures of what I'm trying to say, so. I guess this isn't the best thing ever, so I imagine like moisture going up, kind of cooling and condensing, and whoop, just fanning all over here, and then on this side, it's just like, almost like a, I guess, shadow, just like dry, very little vegetation. I don't think you can even see this, horrible drawing anyways. Um, but another thing is that places on the side of the topographic barrier will often have a lot of precipitation, like a lot of precipitation. Um, so next thing up, not my favorite ever, but still kind of cool, convection, convectional lifting or convection... Convectional precipitation occurs when unequal heating at the Earth's surface creates a hot spot. So, Earth's radiation goes down on Earth. Sun's radiation comes down on Earth. You know, all is good and well. Until one part gets heated a bit more than the rest, unequal 
hot spot. It comes in contact with this, it starts to get warm. The warm air rises as it gets farther up, it cools, condenses, it expands, and it grows. So basically, so here's a picture. So sun, beautiful sun. Can you see this? Probably. So here's the earth. So you see sun going down here. So there's a little, some heat going up. And then it kind of cools, condenses, and it starts to grow vertically. So here, and whoop! So I kind of feel like, that's my second favorite, because it's just like, it just grows up and you can't really tell. If something's a convectional cloud, because like it's vertical, it's not sideways. So I do, I just find that really cool. Fun to lifting though, those pictures, they're amazing. I actually might be able to find a picture of fun. Never mind. Google image search hates me. Um, so how does climate affect our local economy? Of course, I can't really tell you too much about this because then I'd kind of be informing you as to my whereabouts. But where I live, we have all four seasons. So it forces us to buy both summer and winter clothes, heating in summer, air conditioning in... Air conditioning in summer, heating in the winter, and... Frost shadowing, my favorite kind of physical weathering. So it kind of cracks up our roads. You know, water gets into the little cracks already. As it gets colder outside, it cools, expands, and it breaks up the roads even more. Um, so that's about it for local economy stuff. Uh, now we're getting into more like soil and stuff and less into clouds. So the four main components of soil are minerals, bacteria, organic material, and moisture, and air. If even one of these things is missing, it's not soil. So let's say you have a really mineral, bacteria, kind of organic material, like it's full of that stuff, there's a lot of air in it, but it's dry as fudge and nuggets. Um, excuse my potty mouth. It's not soil. It's dirt. Treat it like dirt. Don't put it, like, don't use it in your backyard. It's not going to help at all. Um, just don't treat your actual soil like dirt. <laughs> so, um, animals, how do they contribute to the soil? Well, animals contribute to the soil by helping distribute soil particles and nutrients and providing pathways and openings for water and air, like animals like, uh, or insects like worms and ants and stuff like that. Um, also, when they, when larger animals and stuff, they, when they discrete, they also can give these minerals and nutrients back to the earth. And when they die, that, you know, nature's compost. <laughs> Um, humus, that kind of leads on from that. Humus, not to be confused, with hummus. Uh, is the dark upper layer of soil made up of partially decayed plant material. It's important to the soil because it retains the moisture and reuses the decaying plant material. Uh, what is parent material? Unlike my parents, this parent material is the soil that comes from, is the, mini, is the minerals in soil that come from rock. My pants aren't made out of rock. That's why I said that. Um, so, it kind of contributes, obviously, because uh, many minerals, uh, nutrients, like calcium and, like ca calcium, potassium, for example, and plants need nutrients to help them grow obviously just like humans so i guess that's where the name parent material comes from because it's kind of like giving birth to plants and stuff uh soil horizon mm. it's uh 
layer in the soil or a bedrock. Each horizon has different physical, chemical, and biological um, characteristics. Another thing is a soil profile. A soil profile is a, ooh, I need to scroll down here, is a grouping of different horizons or layers and the rock layers or bedrock below the soil. Wow, okay, I actually found pictures for this one. Not in real life, but pictures nonetheless. So usually they go from like O horizon then A to Z. Well, not really Z, I don't think you can get that far down. So this is kind of like a picture of them. I don't wanna go in too far. So kind of like that. Yep, O, A, B, C, D, and then bedrock. Um, Leaching. Oh, I just knew. Um, leaching is the removal of minerals from soil by water as it moves downward through the soil. Um, another thing, like, about this that gives me nightmares is just, like, it also helps me remember, though, too, in a really weird way. So, like, imagine an army of leeches going down through the soil, consuming the earth and everything in their path. Remembering tips, 101, Jamie. Um, ooh, I spent like two hours trying to find this and then my teacher did a little presentation thing and now I know what it is. Uh, region is a geographical area that has similar features within it. Right now we're kind of moving on to vegetation regions. Um, so first off, what is a transition zone? A transition zone is an area where the characteristics of one region Typically, like, you know, they gradually change into those of another. My mom's texting me. Okay, so. Transition zone. So you have a lot of trees here, you know, kind of get more dispersed, kind of, whoop, no trees. Um. What is the tundra and what types of plants go well here? The tundra is the northernmost vegetation region found in areas too cold for trees to grow. But, swear warning, um, bushes, grasses, moss, and similar plants don't give a shit about this, and they grow there anyways. Uh, the tree line, I guess exactly what I just drew here, kind of like a transition zone, but uh, it's more specific. The tree line is the boundary between the tundra and the boreal forest zone. North of this line, it is too cold for trees to grow. Uh, next thing. I love this. Um, so what is permafrost and how does it destroy houses? This is actually easier to do with pictures. So permafrost is like ground that isn't thawed in like the summer. So what happens is, so this is a house, and this is the ground. So the heating from the house in the winter and stuff, it will heat the ground and make it thaw. And so the ground kind of sinks, and what happens is with it, the house kind of cracks. And so it, because houses, unlike some places that are starting to be built more you know, wibbly wobbly because they have a lot of earthquakes and stuff caused by global warming and uh, tricky subject. But anyways, so ground thaws, house kind of goes with it, breaks. Uh, but a lot of places to stop this from happening will build their houses on stilts. I forget where it was, but I went on this trip with my grandpa a couple of years ago when I was like 10. That's actually a while ago. So I passed by some houses with stilts, and now I know why they had stilts. Um, so what are coniferous trees? Coniferous trees are trees with cones and often need like leaves or evergreens. And deciduous trees are trees that shed their leaves annually in the fall, or broadleaf trees, or my hair. Uh, mixed forces, <laughs> mixed forests are forests made up of both 
coniferous and deciduous trees. So, a nice little happy family. Unlike our government. <laughs> I'm just joking. I don't mean to trigger anybody. I'm just joking. Three more things left. Let's pray to... I'm not Christian. Let's pray, pray to all the gods and goddesses out there that I will not fail school. I shouldn't say that, actually. I shouldn't be one of those people because I have good grades. Um, ecology. What is ecology and what is an ecozone? Ecology is the study of living things and how they relate to each other. So, like, biotic things. So, like, um, I am a person. I am a person, too. We both have eyeballs. We both have hair that sheds like a broadleaf tree in the fall. Ecology. Um, <laughs> bit different, but you know, that's the best thing I can come up with on the spot. Ecozones regions, they are regions based on unique ecological characteristics or a large geographical area with like a, then human, how human activities interact with the natural world. I can pronounce really long, I can pronounce really long words like honorific ability, tenidity, tetabus, or hippopotamus, or sesquipedaliophobia, but I can't pronounce words in a sentence like a normal person. Okay, so what ecozone do we live in? Uh, we live in the Boreal, actually that's a pretty big ecozone, Boreal Shield ecozone. I live in the Boreal Shield ecozone. In Canada, that's that. Uh, you can't find where I live still, because that includes a variety of places. Um, my mom would kill me if I actually sent my whereabouts on here, on the internet. Uh, what is the most populated ecozone? The mixed wood plains is the most heavily populated ecozone. I don't live here, luckily. Um, I don't know what I'm saying anymore. I think that this is in, it's right beside the Canadian Shield, the Great Lakes and Lawrence Lowlands. They're kind of around the same area-ish, although the Mixed Plains does touch, I'm not sure if Great Lakes and Lawrence Lowlands does, but uh, Mixed Plains touch on three of the Great Lakes. That's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, that's Geography with Jamie. Don't fail your tests tomorrow. Good luck. What's that thing in Japan? Sayonara? No. Sayonara? That's a lot in all. Goodbye. Have a good night. Don't fail your tests.